Thank you for joining our broadcast today. We want you to be free to hear from God, and we pray that His blessing would be on your life. We're a church that's on mission across the aisle, across the street, and around the world. We believe the gospel changes everything. God bless you. Thanks. 
cold dogs on the hot skillet to make hot dogs. It's going to be the ha happiest ladies in Alcoa right here. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to the media team and for all of you who shared in that uh, occasion where we just ministered across the street. Um, today we have a couple of groups that are out there are noticeable. Our preteens are at preteen camp. I think there's 35 of those little chihuahuas there. And then uh, I noticed you didn't get invited to the beach trip either because they left at 830. Um, so that's Jeremy and his team. But anyway, that's the last couple of trips of the summer, so they're gone. We'll continue to pray for them. But uh, we have a great ministry and a great opportunity to not only reach across the aisle, which is Sunday morning, uh, across the street, which was Freedom Celebration, but actually across the world, and we're doing that. So I'm going to ask Emily Hogan if she will share, because tonight you'll hear more about the Honduras mission trip. And she's going to share a little bit that will draw you back tonight. So give Emily a hand as she comes. Hi, um, I just want to first of all say thank you for each person here who helped make the Honduras trip possible just by giving um, and helping the college students be able to go. Um, a lot of them had never been on a mission trip before out of the country, and that myself included. Uh, we got to see God work in some amazing ways, even from the way that he put our team together. Um, three of our students and adults spoke Spanish. That gave us a huge advantage in being able to communicate with the people there. And um, our days were throughout the mornings, we would go into the community and give food, um, beans and rice. It seemed so simple, just a small bag of beans and rice about this big that would feed a large family for a couple of days. And um, just to see how grateful those people were for just something so small um, and really how desperate um, for just food, just a meal. Um, it was heartbreaking. I mean, it just, we have so much here that we just don't even um, realize just how much a warm meal means. Um, but just the joy that the people had despite their circumstances and how happy they were and receptive to hear a message. Um, a lot of people came to Christ through that, through sharing on the side of the road. Um, another thing uh, that went on was some of our guys got to go to a jail. Um, the prison there and uh, has some great stories which you can hear more about those tonight um, and then we also got to serve with kids that were in the orphanages that we went to visit three uh, actually four children's homes or orphanages um, and just um, to see what those kids have come from and kind of where they were now um, drastically different um, 
and just kind of to see how God has been able to work in their lives. Um, they're being discipled. Um, they're, they have Christian people who are loving on them, um, whereas on the streets they were just um, running around, didn't have family, just kind of left to fend for themselves. And these are kids that are like seven years old, um, you know, and just some horrible things that they've had to go through. Um, but there is a need, and um, I see all the more why Jeff and Leslie feel a heart for this place. Um, and as a church, I see why, you know, the need to support them and help them as well. But the kids will be here tonight, the college students, and they'll be able to tell specific stories and children that they were able to minister to. So I just really encourage you to come back and kind of support them tonight um, and kind of hear just how God worked. Um, it was amazing. And, um, again, thank you for just your part in helping with prayer and with financial, just to get us there. So, you know, last week we uh, we learned a little Spanish in here. We sang a little Spanish last week, and it was good. So we're just broadening things out here because the mission. What you got to remember is across the aisle, across the street, and around the world, it's still bigger than that because God's heart beats for the whole world. So really the mission is anybody we come in contact with. So God's at work right here. It'll be great tonight to hear. Um, if you will, stand. Uh, if you're a guest today, we're glad you're here. We don't point you out, um, but we ask everybody to stand, and we're going to greet one another. There's a card in the pew that uh, you can fill out. If you're a guest, we have a gift for you. So greet one another. self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one, speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, you should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen.
you think about those words you sang? And would you just do that during this prayer? Father, we give ourselves to you. And we surrender all that we are and all that we have and all that we ever hope to be. Uh, we surrender to you. The idea of surrender is we hold nothing back and you get everything. None of the world, all of Christ. And that's what we do and that's who we are and that's why we live. So Father, take the offering as we've already seen it reach people across the aisle and across the street and around the world. We pray you take this offering, multiply it, use it to reach people with the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand as the choir transitions, and thank you, Jennifer and Steve and the team. We, uh, in your bulletin today, you will see the Defense of Marriage Act um, that is being challenged across the nation, and it's provided by Family Research Council, and before we get everybody back for the school year, I wanted to 
address two issues that are facing us as Christians as well as are facing us in the nation, and that is uh, marriage, number one, and number two, uh, pro-life, the right to life of the unborn. And those are two issues that have been battled in courts uh, the last few weeks, even this last week in Texas, uh, the issue of abortion. And one of the things that I've always encouraged you and challenged you to do as a church and as a congregation as well as myself is we can't be lulled to sleep in the pew. We can't be lulled to sleep in the pew by the devil because he would like for us to say ho-hum to this, to be lulled to sleep, but the Bible tells us to take a stand for righteousness and truth, but to do it in a way that is very loving. And so I want to address the issues that are affecting everybody in this room and everybody that's watching by television. Uh, you could be here and this issue affect you as a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, a brother, or a sister. It, it affects every one of us, and what we need to know is what does the Bible say? Because a lot of us get our opinions from other people. And a lot of us get our opinions from things that really don't amount to any substance nor have any source. In fact, you may be here today and you don't know where to take your stand unless somebody tells you where to take your stand. You kind of go with either the culture or with what other people think and then you'll make your decision based on that. I want you to know from the beginning, and this will be no surprise to you, that this is the authority from which I speak. I am not the authority. God is the authority. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the bread man. And so I want you to know that I'm not going to preach this today because I am a preacher and I believe this just because I'm a preacher. I believe there's corroborating evidence in the Scripture from Genesis to Revelation that teaches us what truth is. And so what we want to do is understand the truth and not compromise in that truth, but be very loving to people who may see this different than us, but we've got to take a stand in what the Bible says. And that's actually the problem in churches today. They're not standing for truth and they're not standing for righteousness. And there's no toleration uh, for that kind of thinking. We, the Bible says not toleration will set you free. It says the what will set you free? Truth. The truth will set you free. So I want us to look at the Scripture, and I want us to understand what God has to say, and then I want us to take this and look at how we can make a firm stand and how we can minister in this community to people that are hurting. And I want us to go back to the story of creation, and I'm going to submit to you from the very, very beginning of Genesis 1-1. God sets an order and a, and a uh, separation and a division of what the Bible teaches about marriage. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you um, just to stand out of honor and respect. We won't read all the text that I'm going to look at today, but I'd like for you to turn to Genesis chapter 2, and then we'll back up into Genesis chapter 1. And here's what the Scripture says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable or co comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But Adam, for Adam there was not a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father, look at the text, and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they two shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Father, we trust you. This is your word. This is the book that's being attacked in America, in our schools, and even in our churches. Because some churches have left the truth a long time ago. And they're now sharing what their opinion is on things that you call sacred. You call things unholy uh, that are unholy and things holy that are holy. And we must fall in line with that too. We must land where you land in Scripture. So I pray today under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that you would speak to our hearts 
and that you would help us to come together under the umbrella of the authority of your word on what is marriage and how was it established and what are the principle and, principles and foundations of the truth from your word so that we as missionaries, ambassadors for Christ, can go out into a world that's hurting and share with them the uncompromising, unchanging Word of God in a changing culture. And I pray that we would do it with boldness, with humility, with respect, and with great love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One of the roles that I have, and I have several, but probably the most important is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And I want you to turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, because I want to set this message up by sharing with you why I think it's so important. Paul tells the Ephesians when he's waving goodbye to them that he did not shrink back in teaching them the whole counsel of God. And so I want to be able to say as a pastor and as a mentor and as a friend as one who will be held accountable, that I don't want to shrink back from the tough things in Scripture. And when, when we get attacked, I want us to be able to go to the Word of God. So I want us to be able to teach the whole counsel of God. That's why I teach verse by verse and we go through books of the Bible. We've done some series recently, uh, and we'll get back to some book studies. But I want us to be able to know not only what we believe, I want us to know why we believe what we believe. You, you've got to know the purpose. In 1 Peter 13... 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 talks about, Paul says this, and I think it applies to every area, but specifically today it will apply here, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always, look at the text, be ready to give a defense, circle the word defense, circle that, be ready to give a defense or an apology to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. So Paul says, be ready to give a defense. Uh, the word defense is where we get our word apologetics from. Apologetics is the study of Scripture where you know what the Scripture says so that in the face of contemporary culture where there seems to be culture and Christ colliding together that you and I can articulate, listen carefully, a reason for the hope that is in us and that we have an answer and we don't say go see Freeman or go see so and so or go see this person, but you know, you in your hearts, sanctify the Lord in your heart so that you can give an answer concerning your faith. And a lot of people don't have a handle on what is the answer that's concerning their faith. So Paul says there's got to be a defense. He says here, be ready to give a defense now, uh, or an apology. But an apology does not mean that I'm sorry. An apology doesn't mean I'm sorry. So you don't shrink back and say, I'm sorry, I can't talk about this. An apology means a defense is a term, and it's a legal term that a lawyer would use, and that's what it would be using here in the original language, is that you would have two sides present a case in the court. There would be a, a side over here presenting a case, and then there would be another side over here presenting a case, and then there would be a verdict that would be rendered because of the decision. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, be ready to give a defense, be ready to give apologetics to the answers concerning your faith. So what I'm praying in this message is that you would take the Word of God and you would let it live in you and I would let it live in me in just such a way that we can give a defense. Whether you're a child, whether you're a teenager, this issue is not going to go away. This is an issue that is right before us now and we must know where we stand. You need to know not where Baptists stand or Methodists stand or Presbyterians stand or Church of God stands or Assembly of God in Christ prophecy of Zion stands, you need to know where God stands on the issue. And here's what I would say to you. If you know where God stands on the issue and you go to a church that does not stand where God stands, frequent that church with your absence. And I'm serious as a heart attack. There is nobody, there is nobody that can give their opinion and it not be God's Word and it be backed by the truth of the Scripture. So you can't go by somebody's opinion. You have to go on the Word of God. So what I hope to do as the school year starts, as we are in the midst of this, as this is the talk at Starbucks and everywhere else, what is it that the Bible has to say about giving a defense to this particular issue? The Defense of Marriage Act, which you see before you, there are specific ways in your bulletin in which you can stand. But let's just go to the beginning of Genesis. Uh, you don't have to go to the table of contents. It's the first book. 
Genesis 1-1, and we're just going to travel through this, and you pray for me as I do this, because I know I will be under attack for the things that, uh, that God has put in my heart, and I'm okay with that. Um, But the enemy will try to attack me. There may be people that try to attack me, but I submit to you that I am going to preach the Bible and preach the truth, and when the truth falls, I'm not responsible for what happens. I'm only responsible for bringing the the messenger. So you have to determine whether you're going to follow God, and if I say something that's out of bounds with God's Word, then you come to me, and, and I will listen. But I'm going to use the Scripture. I've always used the Scripture, so here it is. And here's where we start. So you've got to know the history of creation. All right? It says in 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now let's stop right there. Stop right there. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the Bible never argues the existence of God, it assumes the existence of God. The Bible never argues the authority of God, it assumes the authority of God. Now stay with the text. In the beginning, God. All right? So he was God in the beginning. Uh, he, he can't, how can he be God in the beginning? Think about this. Unless he had already begun before the beginning began to begin. Okay? Now let me say that again. How can God be in the beginning unless he had already begun before the beginning began to begin? So the Bible assumes uh, in the defense of Scripture that God was, he was pre existent, the Bible says, in the beginning. So if he was in the beginning, then he must have begun before the beginning began in order to begin. You got that? Okay, thank you. So now we understand that God is pre-existent. And he created, the Bible says, ex nihilo, ex nihilo, out of nothing. And I'll show you that. Look at verse 2. Here's what the Bible says. Now this is important because those people who are against traditional marriage will say that this is only for the beginning of time. This is only a man and a woman for the creation story. I'm going to submit to you that that's not accurate based on Scripture. Verse 2. So we know that God was in the beginning. He was before the beginning, but before time began. Okay? He was preexistent. All right? Now, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we have a formless... So, so God took formless chaos, the phrase without void, and without form and void means formless chaos. So God created, watch this, ex nihilo, out of nothing, He took the cosmos and created it out of chaos. That's who God was. Why? Because He was there before time began. He was preexistent. So there was formless void on the earth, and out of the chaos, God created the cosmos. Okay, so he was pre existent in the beginning. Verse 3, here we go. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Stop right there. This is very important. So what you have here is God created something out of nothing, He created a peace a masterpiece out of confusion. So out of the nothingness that was there, he created something because he was preexistent and he was there before time began. So you have to understand that. And I want to submit to you on just these first verses that God created order. You notice the order? Let there be light. And there was light. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So there's order from the very beginning. He takes the cosmos, creates it out, uh, out of chaos. He creates the cosmos. And so, so what you have have in the first few verses in the first day of creation, stay with me, is a kingdom principle, stay with me, that will last throughout the Bible, and it's the principle of order, the principle of order, and that's very important that you understand that. So God created ex nihilo, nihilo, and it's the principle of order here. Now look at verse 6. Then God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let Uh, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. So we've got, uh, we've got two things here. Number one, we've got the principle of order. It's a kingdom principle that will last throughout Scripture. God is not the author of confusion. He does things in order. It's the same way with creation. And not only does He do things in order, but there's a distinction there. So you need to 
to keep in mind in the first day there was order. In the second day there was a distinction. He divided the firmament from the heavens. And that's very, very important. And so God created, number one, and then He separated out of that creation. And so we see that division that's there. And if you look at the word in uh, the word divide there, you see the word divide in 6 and 7. Um, the word divide means to make a distinction between. And if you'll stay with me here, we're going to make a distinction between a male and a female. It's a kingdom principle. So you've got the kingdom principle of order. You've got the kingdom principle of division. Now, let's go a little further. Let's go to the fourth day. It starts in verse 16. Then God made, two great, then God made great light, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. 17. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. You see the reiteration of the principle of order and distinction. Order and distinction. God divided. God separated. It'll stay with me. It'll make sense. Male and female, he created them. Distinction and order. Okay? Now let's go to the sixth day. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created, here it is. So God created man in his own image, the image of God. He created male, here's the distinction, male and female he created them. So you've got in the first verses of Genesis chapter 1, you've got the principle of order. Then you see the principle of distinction, uh, of, of separation. And now you see the very existence of God, the very essence of God is a mutual distinction, stay with me, between a male and a female. That's very, very clear. So you've got order, you've got distinction. You've got order and distinction in creation. You've got order and distinction in male and female. All right? Now, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Let's build on that principle. Genesis chapter 2. Okay? So if you've got the principle of order, the principle of distinction, and the essence of God is shown in the image of God by a distinction of a male and a female, then it says here in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Stay with the text. Uh, your word may be helpmate or helpmeet, uh, helper, uh, suitable to, corresponding to him. And so let's look at the first word in verse 18 because I told you to don't overlook the little words. The word and. And the Lord said, or your translation may say, then the Lord said. What's he saying? Well, what God is saying prior to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, is he's saying, everything that I made, it's like God made everything, the garden made everything, creation, and he stepped back and he said, I love this to the supermax. This is great. This is my creation. And then he says, and then he says. So, so you got to get the context, and the text is within the context. Everything that God said, perfect order, perfect distinction that he's made. And then he says, and then God said, or then the Lord said. It's not good that man should be alone. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper, a helpmate comparable to him, suitable to him. Now the idea, if God is a God, who he is, of order and one of distinction, and he's already made a distinction between the male and the female, what he's saying here is uh, the word helper there means to, uh, to, to help the boy. Help the boy. Uh, when you get married, I always usually try to say your role, wife, is to help this boy and he needs help. You're there to be suitable to, corresponding to, to be a helpmate. Because what God is saying is I have created man. Stay with me. This goes... This will fly right in the face of everything you've heard, but this is the Scripture. And it's going to go against what a well-known television evangelist said. Is he said recently that God blesses homosexual marriages, and I want you to know that God has never blessed that, and God has always from the beginning said there's a male and a female. So when an evangelist or somebody stands up and says that, homosexuality is a gift from God. It flies in the face of Scripture, and we must as Christians stand on the Scripture of order and distinction and separation between a male and a female because the purpose of God when He created woman was that man was incomplete. So if man is incomplete, she has what's going to complete man. 
And that's very important to understand that. And so here's what he says. Man should not be alone. I'll make a help, helper. Look at this. Comparable to him. Not like him. He didn't make man like another man. He didn't make woman like another woman. Look at this. He made, he made man, look at this, comparable to him, not like him. Not like him. Like him makes good friends. Uh, like him is a good friendship. But corresponding to is someone who's opposite to him that can complete man because the Bible says that God made us, uh, if you will, we're incomplete unless we have the help of God and the help of God issues a woman to complete us as a man. So marriage is between a man and a woman because man is incomplete without the completion that God has through the woman. And so God takes a rib out of man and completes him with that rib with the woman. And so it's a beautiful thing. And listen to me, one of the purposes of marriage is to be comparable to. It, the, the idea in the Hebrew is a word that means stand opposed to. It means distinctively different. So a male and a female, they're not like each other. Stay with me. They are compatible to each other. And it means to stand opposite to. So the idea is that God created man and His opposition to creating man, He put woman on the other side to stand in distinctly different than Him. Because whatever man is, He's incomplete without the help that God's going to bring Him. And so that's just 18. You see that? Do you follow what the text is saying? So in order to be complete, God says I've got to complement. And in order to complement... I've got a plan, God says, of order and distinction, a male and a female. That's God's plan for marriage. It's always been God's plan for marriage. It's been God's plan from the beginning because the help that she's going to bring to the help that he needs can only be fulfilled in the destiny of God for two people coming together under the umbrella of oneness that God has set from the beginning of order and distinction. So that is God's plan. And see, any time you begin to meet your needs without trusting in God's plan, you cannot meet your needs because it says here in the text that God initiated this. Here's what it says. Look at the text. I, verse 18, will make a helper comparable to him. I will make one. God takes the initiative in meeting our needs so that anyone outside of the will of God in the area of sexuality who tries to meet their God-given needs apart from Creator God cannot meet those needs and they be fulfilled because only God can take the initiative to meet our needs. And God says the need of a man is a woman who I am created to complement him, corresponding to, to make him to fulfill his destiny. And I want to submit to you in this verse... He establishes what he's already established in Genesis 1, order and distinction. Order and distinction. Verse 19, out of the ground. Remember, this is to give us a defense. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds, and to the air. Notice how quick he was to give all those names. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, as are some of you. And he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken, watch this, from the man he made into a woman. And let's just stop there. So one of the purposes of marriage is to, um, you've got to understand the totality of Scripture. It's called systematic theology. Uh, God, there's several purposes in marriage. Uh, and so if he's going to make a... Uh, a helpmate comparable to us, uh, male and female, he makes them comparable. You can't have somebody like you. You have to have somebody who stands in opposition to you, and that's what the word means in the Hebrew. And then God says uh, that there's a bigger picture here because one of the purposes of marriage is to procreate, uh, for men and women to be fruitful and multiply. And so let's go to Genesis chapter 1. 
verses 28. And let's look at one of the purposes of marriage. This is one. The other would be very clear to, to be a helpmate, to, to share life together, to, um, to, to, to compromise together, to love together, to, to share, to, to, uh, to disagree even together. But it's that helper that stands opposite of you, that's comparable to you, that God says is important. But, but one of the purposes of a heterosexual marriage is for the couple um, to procreate and to produce children. That's what the Bible says. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so let me just share with you, because I've done a a lot of research on this, one of the um, big proponents of same-sex marriage is they believe that um, this scripture, when a heterosexual couple, a man and a woman, come together and cannot have children, and that would represent many of you, many people in congregations today, many people across this world today. There are males and females who cannot obey God's command of be fruitful and multiply because they can't have children. And so what those who are of the same-sex marriage would say that that invalidates the marriage totally. It invalidates the purpose of marriage because uh, uh, same-sex relationships, they can't produce children. So how can you tell me that God blesses a marriage between a male and a female in a heterosexual relationship when they can't produce children? And those on the other side would say simply, and this is their theology, that it invalidates the marriage between a man and a woman. And I would say the answer is no, it doesn't. Because the purpose of marriage is not just to have children, it's to live in a corresponding way in which you and I share life together with our mate. And God says it is to, He brought someone who's comparable, who's suitable, who is a helpmate. So, so I would say the argument from that side, as I present this case to the court, the argument from the side of same sex marriages, that holds no water because it's just not God's purpose to pre produce children. It is God's purpose that we live in a way that we share life. In we share Christ and we share love. And so that's the purpose of marriage because the whole idea of marriage is two people becoming one, that you can say, I'm better can serve the Lord together as a team than we can as individuals. Now, let me say this. I want to encourage us to be fruitful and to multiply. And some of you need no encouragement. And here's why I'm saying this. Do you know the spread of Islam is taking rampant worldwide and you know how they're doing it? producing children, where God's people are saying, ha, I think we've got enough. Listen, if we want to carry the gospel to the end, then it would be a good idea if we trained our children and we had more children. And some of you say, but I had this surgery. I can't have children anymore. Let me tell you, God can surprise anybody. Ask some people around here. He can do it. So what I'm saying to you is if we're going to be fruitful and multiply, then we ought to take that seriously because what we want to do is hand down to this next generation. See, what we tolerate, the next generation is going to know by what we tolerate it. And so, uh, so what we've got to understand is that, that God says one of the purposes of marriage is to reproduce children, but it's not the only purpose of marriage. And the other side would say, as they would build their case in defense court, would say it invalidates the marriage between a male and a female. And the answer is no, it does not. Chapter 2, let's go a little further. And Adam said, now now you've got to get this picture. And Adam said, after, after all this has calmed down, God pulls the rib, creates woman, Adam's missing something. The woman has something now that she was missing. Um, and it's, in, it, she, it's all working together in God's plan. Now stay with me. And he says, and this is what the Hebrew means, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Do you know what he called her at the very beginning after he calmed down? He called her what? This. He he, he was so excited, he he didn't even know what to call her. You're you're just a this. That's what you are, female. You're this. He, he, He didn't even know what to say. But let me give you the Hebrew here. The Hebrew word, this is now bone of my bones, 
It, the idea is this is a, a, a joyous astonishment. It would be like translating in our language. It would be, woo-wee, yeah, this is good. And God created, as, God, as, as Adam stepped back, uh, Adam looked and he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called, whoa, man, God did good here. That's what he said. Now, now, you've heard that before, and I stole that, and I wouldn't even give credit to the guy I stole it from. But uh, Now, let me show you something, because I want to make sure that we understand this, because this is God's Word. And this is, see, we have to determine where we land on this particular issue. And, and, and I'm going to help you toward the end, give you just some practical things. But I'm just going strictly by the text here. If you look at verse 22, the word for Hebrew, and this is so important, is the word ish for man. The word ish for man. And if you look at verse 23, the word isha is the Hebrew word for woman. So you've got the word ish, which is man, isha, which is woman. Do you know what they both mean? Do you know where the root word comes from? Ish is the word the piercer. Isha is the pierced. Isha, ish, pierce, the piercer. Isha, the pierced. And that's how God says that we procreate, okay? So this is from the very beginning. And I want to submit to you, when God establishes an order in the principle of the kingdom of order and distinction and a distinction between a male and a female, this pattern is to be used and is used throughout Scripture. You can go into Ephesians. You can see the roles of the man and the woman in marriage. But this is very important. So you have Ish, the man, the piercer. Isha, the woman, the pierced. Now look at 24. Look at 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There it is. A man shall leave, let's take the first phrase, leave his father and mother. You know how I can tell you when a marriage isn't going to work? I can call it before it ever starts. When a man is not ready and prepared to leave everything behind him, and give total uh, capacity to love his wife if he or she is still hanging on to the cord. The Bible says to cut the cord and uh, doesn't ever leave, mean to leave the wisdom of your parents, but you must establish your own home. And so when the Bible says the purpose of marriage is to leave his father and mother, if a man is not ready to leave his father and his mother, he is not ready to lead his wife. That's what the Bible says. That's not Freeman's opinion. That's what the Bible says. And so many marriages uh, are struggling today because the man never left. The man never grew up. He never grew up uh, spiritually, emotionally, physically. He just was in lust instead of being in love. And there's a difference between being in lust and being in love. Love is agape love that God does. So, Paul, so, so right here, Paul says the same thing, but Genesis, it says from the beginning, Therefore, a man shall leave, look at this, leave his father and mother. This is marriage. This is the defense of marriage act that we're talking about. Here's the second thing. And be joined to his wife. So not only do you leave, you cleave. You're, you're super glued. The idea in the Hebrew, you're connected in such a way that nothing can separate you from that relationship. That's the purpose of marriage. And then he says, and the two shall become one flesh. Um, Ecclesiastes says a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So the idea is the Holy Spirit takes, for example, here's what happened at my wedding in 1989. Ah, oh, I stood here, not here, Leslie stood here, and the Holy Spirit was all here, hovering over, in, living inside. And so the Holy Spirit took Freeman and Leslie, the two becoming one, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So you have the Holy Spirit, you have Freeman, and you have Leslie, and you have the Holy Spirit that entwines you. You must leave, you must cleave, and you must have the Holy Spirit weave your lives together. And that is the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is never between a male and a male and a female or a female, because that is what is called marriage today. And I want you to know that that is a misnomer. A marriage is between a man and a woman that follows the guidelines and the principles of Scripture. And when you understand that, then you know where you stand and you also know where you land. You say the argument from this side of the court, 
would be it's for the creation story. Well, I want to submit to you some other verses to look at. Genesis, uh, Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They surely shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them over to their vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural cause for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. I want to submit to you from, from Genesis, from the Old Testament into the New Testament, the only marriage that God ever blessed was a heterosexual marriage between a male and a female. He never blessed any other kind of relationship. And if you're here today and you're in a heterosexual marriage and you are living in an adultery or you are having an affair, that is a sin and that is a transgression against God. If you're here today in a same-sex relationship, that is a sin and it is against a holy God because the only marriage that God says is one that He initiated in Scripture which will stand the test of time uh, which the song that the choir sang evermore this, this, this message and this truth will be forevermore is a marriage between a man and a woman that come together in a corresponding relationship suitable to with harmony that only God can create and so if you want to make a defense for the gospel which Peter says to do take someone to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Now, there's other places we can go, but I want to uh, share with you an illustration that I believe might take me some time, and I want us to have some application and some time of prayer at the end. I have a friend who grew up in New York in a very poor, poor home. He has given his heart to Jesus. But he shares this story. Growing up in what he called a cell of an apartment. An apartment block in New York where people that were impoverished and poor lived. And he, he didn't have food. He didn't really have a relationship with his father. He didn't know where his father was. And if he did know where his father was, he was usually drunk, intoxicated, and beating on his mother. And so he grew up in this New York neighborhood, and he tells this story how when it was time to go in, uh, all the other children who had parents together, um, they had to go in at a certain time because they had a curfew, but not him. See, he was allowed to run the streets, he and his friends. And so when they were young, they thought, wow, this is just really great because you know what? We don't have to answer to anybody else. We are our own authority. Isn't this great? Everybody else has to be in at a certain time, but we don't have to be in at all. In fact, nobody cares. They have dads that care and moms that care, but we don't have a dad. We don't know where our mom necessarily is, so we can stay out all night long. Isn't that fun? And the answer is no. No. And he shares the story himself, how to this day he's an insecure man. Because of what he didn't get from his home, when he was young. And he talks about the insecurity. And he said, oh, how I wish, oh, how I wish that I had a dad who would have drawn the boundaries of this is right and this is wrong. Instead of being able to run the streets and get involved in things that we had no business getting involved in, I wish now, he says, I had a dad that would have sat us down and drew the lines of this is right 
and this is wrong. And you know what he says? And I do now. Because when he met Jesus, he also came in contact with the perfect father. Now listen to me carefully. Every one of us in this room is searching for the perfect father that we never had. Every single one of us is searching for the perfect father that we never had. Now listen to me carefully. And transcendent God, the father, came near to us in Emmanuel. His name is Jesus. So the Father that all of us are searching for, that we could never have, regardless of where you are today on the issue of homosexuality or traditional marriage, regardless of where you are on that, we are all a people that are searching for a perfect Father. And I want to submit to you that Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. When you come to me, I'm going to show you a perfect Father. Because Freeman, see, for some of us, we we view our father. When we think of, oh, you want to see God as a perfect father? We don't want that kind of father. Because if God's anything like my father, I don't want anything to do with God. But let me tell you something. God is different than your father. He's perfect. He's Abba Father. And do you know that some of you today, even in heterosexual relationships, you are craving a father hunger, and you can only get that through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can only, Jesus says, come to me. And when he says, come to me, he doesn't say, I'll give you a sermon. He says, I'll give you what? Rest. I'll give you rest. See, some of you are trying to fulfill your God-given destiny outside the boundaries of what God has established in his word. And so, I don't know where you stand on this issue of homosexuality, traditional marriage, but I do know how you arrived at your answer. You arrived by saying, there is some source of authority in my life that I hold higher than any other authority, and that's how you came up with it. Whatever your answer is, that's what you came up with. But I want to submit to you that every one of us are looking for a father who's perfect. And the only way we can find that Father is come to Jesus, submit to Him, surrender to Him. Say, Jesus Christ, I come to You, the Savior of the world, and I want You to forgive me of my sins because whether I'm in a heterosexual relationship or a same-sex marriage, I need to know what love is. And I would submit to you, even if you're watching by television and you're in a same-sex relationship, if you'll listen to me with all the love that I can share with you, you're looking for a partner. And I want to tell you who the perfect partner is. His name is Jesus Christ. You are looking for life. You're not really gay at all. You're depressed. You're discouraged. Something happened back here that is causing you to gravitate toward this relationship. And I want to tell you that Jesus Christ can change it all. He loves you. He loves you. Listen to me, church. We, by the grace of God, We'll love people on the other side of the defense. I've made my decision. We're going to love people. We're not going to condemn them. And it even says that in your bulletin insert. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. We are going to speak the truth to people. We're going to speak the truth, but we're going to love them. Because you see, there's not a one of us in this room that doesn't have sin in their life, including this pastor. Every one of us has sin, and we want to take this sin and say, oh man, listen, if you're this, then what about you? What about me? Let me ask you a question. Where were your sins put when Jesus Christ came into your life? The Bible says he cast them off as far as the east is from the west to remember them no more. So you remember your sin, and I remember my sin, but God says, I don't even know what you're talking about. So people that are struggling with this issue, It can be within your family. It can be at school. It can be in friendships. What we have to do is take the love of God and the Word of God and the heart of God and say to somebody, God has a plan. And His plan is that corresponding relationship that it says in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. So if we're going to be the church, what we can't do is go out there and beat people up over this issue. We've got to go out there and love them unto Christ. It's the same way with abortion clinics. You can't go out there and be mean-spirited. The Bible never gives us an opportunity to be mean-spirited. If you're mean-spirited, that's fleshly. So what I'm encouraging us to do as a church today, and what I'm encouraging me to do today, is to get on our, on our faces before God and get humbly before God and ask God 
to give us the power and the ability to love people in their mess just like we were loved in our mess. Lynn Tipton said it right on Wednesday night when we were discussing this. He said, it all boils down to, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Let me tell you, the issue today is not gay or not gay. Here's the issue. Who's calling the shots in your life? That's the issue today. Who's calling the shots in your life? See, you can be in a heterosexual relationship and everything be fine there, but God's not calling the shots in your life. Therefore, you're dabbling in things that you shouldn't be dabbling in. You can be in a same-sex relationship today and God not be calling the shots. All you have to ask is the question is, who's calling the shots in my life? Or am I or am I willing to submit, uh, submit to transcendent God who showed himself in the form of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, and if I can reach out to him, he will reach out to me. Truth without love is condemnation. Love without truth is compromise. You got that? So we are going to love people. We're going to tell them there's hope in Jesus because when you were in your mess, somebody told you about Jesus Christ. So if we're going to be a church that ministers to people across the street, across the aisle, and around the world, then we got to have a loving heart toward people. We've got to minister to people, and we've got to tell them that there's only one way. But listen, in telling them that there's only one way and in telling them where we stand on marriage, we never compromise this. And that's where church... Here's the problem in churches today. Nobody stands up for what they believe anymore. We just don't. We have been lulled to sleep by the enemy. And listen, I'm telling you, stand. Stand for the rights of the unborn. Stand for traditional marriage. Because where you do, if you don't know how to stand, you'll fall for anything. You'll fall for anything. The Bible teaches that. I love it when Paul says in Ephesians, he says, stand, and when you don't know what else to do, stand some more. And then just keep on standing forevermore. That's what we do. But we do it with love. We do it with love. So I want to ask you a question in closing today. Who's calling the shots in your life? Who's calling the shots? Is God? You know, I did a four-part series on this on Sunday night that gave, you, that gave help to parents that are struggling, teenagers that are struggling with this issue, brothers and sisters. And I would encourage you to get that if you need some encouragement, some steps. But I wanted to establish today, as our country is on a collision course with the Word of God, I just want us to know where we land, and I want you to be able to give a defense concerning your faith. Would you pray with me this morning? You say you might expect me to use the Bible because I'm a pastor. I want to turn it around and say I expect you to use the Bible because you're a Christian. I expect you to stand where the Bible stands on issues of life, issues of marriage. There's not anything that the Bible doesn't cover. And oh, how we would wish today for some in this room that they had a dad who would say, this is right and this is wrong. You know, this sermon for you may not have been mar about marriage. It may be about who is the resource and source in your life. Are you calling the shots? See, if you're here today and you're calling the shots in your life, the Bible says you're in charge. And the Bible says by you being in charge, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You don't have to call the shots any longer. He can call the shots and you can submit to him. I want to encourage you today. If you don't know Jesus, would you just trust him today? Would you give him your life? Would you just pray a prayer? God, come into my heart in the form of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive me for my sin. And he will save you. He'll save you today. Could I encourage everybody in this room to deal with their father wounds? I'm an imperfect father, and so are you, Dad. 
But we have a perfect father. We don't point our children to us. We point them to Abba Father, who's perfect. So even in our imperfection, if we get this right and point our children to the God who is perfect and can call the shots in their life, then I would say we're a good dad because we pointed them to the one who can change them. For some of you, you're afraid to to crawl into your Abba Father's lap because when you crawled into Daddy's lap, there was nothing there. It's a disconnect. I'm trying to tell you today, the issue is not necessarily marriage. It's who's calling the shots in your life. Maybe you want to deal with your father wounds, your hurt. Maybe you're in a heterosexual relationship. The devil's working on you. And he'll take 30 years to destroy your marriage in one bad decision. Maybe you need to determine who's calling the shots in your life. See, it's about that issue. I want to invite you to let Jesus call the shots. And let's be a church that that knows where we stand on the issues that are facing our country. And let's be a voice of hope a voice of encouragement, a voice that can tell anybody what you're really looking for is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what you're looking for. Because can I tell you something? Based on statistics, people that are in same-sex relationships are more suicidal, are more, more prone to addictions. It can happen with anybody. But that's what the statistics say. But Jesus Christ can break it all. He can break the sin in my life. He can break the sin in your life. And don't think for a moment there's not anybody here that doesn't have something that needs to be dealt with at the foot of the cross. So before we point fingers and before we start casting the stone, let's remember he who is without sin, the Bible says, cast the first stone. So I'm pretty sure we'll put any stones down today. And we'll just get on our knees before God and ask God to do a work in our marriages that we would be good models to people, that we would be great models for our children, and that we'd be a picture of Jesus Christ to the world. In fact, Jesus, ask us to come in a feminine role today and be the bride of Christ. In the form of the bride of Christ. He asked us to take the position of a feminine role. Be the bride of Christ today. So would you do that wherever you are watching by television in this auditorium today? Would you do what God tells you to do? I'm going to ask us to stand. If you just stand where you are. And I'm going to invite you, if the Holy Spirit would lead you, to come to this altar, to kneel in the aisle, to kneel